good. <laughs> All right, it's 7 o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started. We'll start with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to come together in your name, knowing and trusting uh, that that means you are with us in a unique and special way. We pray as we continue to study on prayer that you will guide us and direct us, that you will teach us, uh, help us to open our hearts and our minds uh, in how that we can grow and mature in our relationship with you and in our communication with you. And I pray uh, that by doing so, we will not only just learn uh, different things that we can do, we will actually put them into practice. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, just so you know, before we uh, close tonight, next Wednesday, we will not have class. Okay, just next Wednesday, that should be it. Uh, God willing, for the rest of the year, Carrie and the girls and I, we're going to go on a mini vacation. So we'll be leaving Sunday after church and then coming back probably Saturday night. Uh, so, uh, so next week, you can come if you want. <laughs> I just, I won't be here. Uh, I mean, you can come here and sit here and stare at each other. Maybe uh, Cheryl will teach. She's been wanting to teach on Wednesday night, so she's, she's got a desire to preach. All right. So also, too, for those of you who don't come on Sunday, we have, we're, we're doing, where we're memorizing Bible verses. That's not something that's just for children. That is actually something that is for everyone. And as you can see, we made 60, about 15 of them were taken Sunday. Uh, so if you like one, you can take one. And if you took one as a couple and you want one as individuals, that is fine as well. You can take them. We're going to leave them until they're all gone. So uh, it, that was a lot of work for 15 of them to be gone. Uh, but anyway, uh, last week we talked about the examination of consciousness. And we talked about uh, being aware of where... Uh, of God's presence in our life throughout the day. And today, the second part of that is the examination of conscience. And this is when we invite the Lord to search our hearts. And we've talked about this a little bit uh, into the very depths of who we are, where we're asking God, what are my motivations? What are my attitudes? What are the real reasons I'm doing this or doing that? And when we're asking God to search us, we're not doing so in fear or in dread. But we're asking him to search us so that we can reveal, he can reveal to us more of ourself and so that we know ourselves better in order for us to ultimately love him more and greater. Uh, one of the, I mean, I've said this many, many times that the hardest person to get to know is yourself. And the person that we lie to the most is ourself. And the, the person who we most deceive in our motivations and our attitudes are also ourself. And so in order to walk uh, in obedience uh, as Jesus is our Lord and Savior, we need him to reveal who we really are. And we need him to reveal the sin that is in us, reveal the improper attitudes and the improper motivations that exist. Now, if we try to do this without him, we'll just end up justifying our actions, and justifying who we are. You know, we'll just say, well, I'm innocent, I'm pure, my motivations are good. And probably every one of us in this room has thought, oh, I'm doing this for the right reason. But if God really revealed our motivations, we would realize, eh, maybe not as much as I think. Uh, but with God's help, he will lovingly show us the areas of our life where he seeks to cleanse us and deliver us from. And we can be comforted by God's searching and uh, that he will never allow us to see more than we can handle. Now, sometimes, you know, you, you know you, maybe you even prayed that prayer, God search my heart, and you have, an, you have an awareness of one or two things that you're really, really struggling with, and you might have this temptation to think, and that's it. I'm just struggling with these two things. No, God has just revealed to you two things, one or two things. There's much more behind it. He just don't, he's not going to show it all to you at one time, because if he did, it would be overwhelming. And so... Uh, that's why it's not a searching of condemnation. It's not God trying to condemn you by revealing the things in us that we need to repent from, that we need to grow in, and those kind of things. Because if he did show us everything, it would be so discouraging and leave us feeling so hopeless that we wouldn't know what to do with our life. 
And, uh, you know, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know, you might have this thing that you're struggling with and God has showed it to you and you're, you know, you're, you're working with God to, to, you know, to overcome this and then you, you, you think you've made it and you've overcome it and then suddenly there's something else. It's because God has said, okay, you've taken care of that for now. Here's another thing. And that's the difference between the Holy Spirit's conviction or convincing. I like the word convincing more than conviction. It means the same thing. Then guilt and shame. Guilt and shame makes you try to feel bad generally. Like there's, I mean, the devil will try to make all of your sin. All, you have no hope. You feel where the Holy Spirit says, no, fix this one thing. Fi- focus on this one thing. Don't worry about all this other stuff. Focus on this one thing, and then you'll be, uh, then we'll, we'll, go, we'll move on to the next thing. He's very specific in his convincing or convicting us of our sin. He doesn't do it vaguely or, or, or just openly. He does it very, very specifically. But if, again, if we try to conduct a self-examination, either we will blame ourselves excessively or we will praise ourselves excessively. And both of those are bad. Now, one thing that I have, uh, you know, in, in most of my previous ministry, all I worked with laity, I didn't work with them as much as I do, of course, now. And one thing that I, 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 I've picked up on is there's a lot of people in the church who it's not excessive justification of sin, it's excessive condemnation of self, which God doesn't want that either. Okay? For things that they've done in the past, they feel so guilty for, so regretful for, and, and regret is fine. We all have regret, but they let it control them so much that they go to the excessiveness of, oh, I'll never be any good. I'll never be able to be used by God. I'll never be, I cannot receive God's grace and his freedom from sin because of who I am. And we can go to the other way. And, I, and I've encountered a lot of people like that in which the excessive praise of ourself or the excessive blame of ourself, both are equally not pleasing to God, and that's not what he's seeking. He is seeking to encourage us and to care for us. But when we allow allow God to be the one who carefully examines us, then we can be certain that whatever he shows us ultimately is for our good, okay? If you're doing something, let's say you're even serving in the church, and and God reveals to you that your motivation in doing it, not doing it's wrong, but that your motivation is, is wrong, that you're not doing it for him, that you're doing it for acknowledgement or you're doing it for praise or you're doing it uh, out of self-righteousness or pride or you're just doing it so, you know, that you can uh, look good before other people. And he reveals that to you, okay? It's not, again, to make you feel condemned. He wants you to see that, recognize it, repent from it, do it for his glory, and then that ultimately is for your good because transformation will take place in the process. Uh, But although the prayer of examination can be very painful, uh, it's a purifying fire. You know, it's, it's for purification, and it's always done through the love of God. When God, when we're praying, God, search my heart, examine me, and he reveals something to us, he's doing it because he loves us. And that's just, you know, it can be, and why is it so painful? Because we're so prideful. You know, we think we're holy. We think we're doing so great. We think, you know, we're the righteous ones. And suddenly God shows us that our attitude's not what it should be or our motivations aren't what it should be. And that makes us, oh, wow, you know, you're, you know God, you're right. And then puts us down, you know, humbles us a little bit. Uh, it can be painful, but God's doing it for our good because ultimately he wants us to be like Christ. So what is the purpose of examination? One, it produces the priceless grace of self-knowledge. Knowing ourselves so that we can know God more. And we talked about this when Carrie was teaching on uh, emotionally healthy spirituality, that as we know ourself, we can ultimately know God more. Because once we realize that our motivations are right, and we, then we realize what, how God wants us to be motivated, we can take a step in that direction. Okay? Also, self-knowledge. and and we've talked about this a lot, when God presents us our sin and the need to repentance arises, okay, that doesn't push us away from God. God isn't taking a step back, okay? We choose to repent, and as we repent, it moves us closer to God. The more we repent, the closer we will get to God. It is one of the amazing things to me 
in the church today in the Western in, in the United States, people, Christians, don't want to repent. They're embarrassed to repent. They don't want to, 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 to come up and say, God, I was wrong. I am sorry. I'm going to turn from this and walk in the direction you want me to go because that is the only way we will get closer to a holy God. Repentance is the only way. Okay? And you say, well, what about abiding? Yes, but what is abiding? What's it going to produce? It's going to produce repentance. The more you abide, the more you get in God's presence, He's holy. The more his holiness will illuminate our unholiness, it will reveal our sin. We repent, take care of that, take a step closer to God. And then another thing, and another thing. And it, just, it, is, a, it is a non-ending uh, process that will take in our entire lives is, will be one of repentance. Now, that might not be a comforting thing. You might think, well, I just want to come to the point where I don't sin anymore. Then die. Uh, because that's it. That's, that's pretty much what it's going to have to take. And, but until then, while we're living in this sinful world, and while we have this influence of sin in us and this indwelling sin that we struggle with and that we fight with every day, this battle that we're facing, this, this military terminology that, we, that the, 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 the Bible uses in our struggle, not against necessarily just the world, but our struggle against ourselves, is that we have to fight this fight and not give up. Run the race and not stop running. And eventually we will be victorious. We will be fully sanctified through the work of the Holy Spirit upon our death. But at the same time, and while we're in this earth, you just got to keep fighting. You got to keep battling this battle. When we stick our hands in our pockets and think, I've done enough, I've arrived, I'm here, you're in big, 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 big trouble. Big trouble. Anyone who thinks they do not have a need to repent is in big trouble. And that doesn't mean no matter how long you've been in church. And, I mean, even if tonight, if, you sit, if you're sitting there thinking, there is nothing in my life that I need to repent for, you better be praying, God, search my heart. Because I promise you, there's something there. Okay? It could be an attitude. It could be a, uh, a motivation. It could be a sin of omission. Okay? It could be multiple things. Now, don't let that discourage you. We live in a, a time of grace, all right? We have the grace of God upon us, uh, and so it's a thing that even though we know that's there, we depend upon the righteousness of Christ, the grace of God, in order to overcome these things, but we need this knowledge of ourselves. We also need to be aware of our evil so that we can deny, ignore, and resist that evil with God's strength, the strength of the Holy Spirit. And, and so our sinfulness, if we don't, our sinfulness will actually become our daily bread instead of God providing our daily bread, which is him, Christ, the bread of life, all right? And so, I mean, have you ever thought about asking something? And this is not the kind of thing you're going to post. Oh, today I found out this is my evil. <laughs> you know, I'm a selfish person. You don't see many people post that kind of thing. Uh, and of course, our Facebook life is the life that we want people to think we live. But, you know, if we were to be, a, as we pray this prayer of examination, we ask God, search me, reveal to me. You know, it's, again, it's not that God is learning something. God will teach us something about ourself. Also through this prayer and through faith in Jesus, this self-knowledge leads to a place of self-acceptance that draws us closer to God's saving grace. You say, well, how is that? When you realize what a pathetic wretch you really are, then you will understand my only chance is Jesus, my Savior. He's my only chance. There's no room for pride. There's no room for humility. Now, again, remember, but Paul, at the end of his life, after all that he had done, writing a majority of books in the New Testament, all these things, he said, I am a wretch. I am the chief of sinners at the end of of his, his time. And so it's a thing of when we become aware of our, uh, of our indwelling sin, of our struggle against sin, of, our, of how we really, really are, it makes us absolutely 100% dependent on Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what he wants. Because you have no chance without him. You have no chance to be righteous without Christ. Our righteousness is as dirty rags before God. Only 
because of the great exchange, only because Jesus took our sins upon himself and in return gave us his righteous life and to our credit will we ever stand before God. And uh, the prayer of examination helps us achieve all of this. Now again, how to practice this, we need to turn inward. And we're talking about turning inward. And it can be a little oversimplifying and misleading when I talk about the prayer of consciousness and the prayer of conscience uh, as if they're completely separate. They're kind of like waves in the ocean. They come and go, but they're still connected, okay? And they're not, you can't fully separate them. They kind of overlap one another. Because how are you going to be aware of the sin in your life if you're not aware of God's presence in your life? And if you're aware of God's presence in your life, he's holy, it's naturally going to re reveal the sinfulness in your life. And uh, this can, I mean, it can, if you let it, the devil can take this awareness and make you very discouraged. Hey, there's times when I'm praying, it's like, God, can you just work faster? Because <laughs> I'm very frustrated with myself, okay? I don't trust myself. I don't, like my, I don't like the way I consistently fail you. I don't want to sin against you. Can you just work faster, okay? But God is patient. I mean, that's also part of the love of God is his patience with us. <laughs> he looks at you and he says, I know you're a pathetic wretch. That's why I sent my son to die. Okay? That's why Jesus did what he did. Just depend upon me, and I'll get you to where you're going. Okay? He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Carrie. Carrie mentioned the fact that we need to continue to put forth the effort with the acknowledgement that we cannot earn. Uh, exactly. I mean, this is one of the great divisions in the body of Christ. <laughs> Unconditional eternal security, which says once saved, always saved, is an oversimplification of the grace of God. And then you have pretty much sometimes the other view of, you know, if you're walking through your house, you stump your toe, you say a curse word, have a heart attack and die, you're going to burn in hell forever. That is the other side, and that and both are equally wrong. Okay? God wants us to put forth the effort. How do we put forth the effort? I know you abide, spend time with God, prayer, Bible study, prayer of examination, and all the other prayers that we're going to be talking about in this series. Uh, you know, fasting, solitude, corporate worship, corporate fellowship, uh, ministry as far as serving, you know, in the church and outside the church, witnessing, all these things combine in how we, uh, we put forth the effort in God's work in us, but we can't earn it, okay? Again, not my quote, Dallas Willard, which I just love this quote, God is not against effort, God is against earning you can't earn it, but you have to put forth the effort, okay, and, 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 and I've gave this example before, when you got saved, let's just say you got saved in a church like this, a, a pastor gave an invitation for you to accept Christ, where was your effort? You came down, you walked down here, you prayed, Jesus, I'm a sinner, save me, okay, you put forth the effort, but you didn't earn salvation by putting forth the effort, Jesus earned your salvation on the cross and through the resurrection, okay? And that is the difference. We have to take steps of faith. We have to pray. We have to abide. We have to read the Bible and study the Bible. We have to be a part of the body of Christ. We have to worship God. We have to fellowship with one another. We have to fast and simplicity and solitude and, and secrecy and all the other disciplines of our faith. We have to put forth the effort, but God alone earns it. In the effort, in the abiding, you are not sanctifying yourself. You are participating with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is doing the work. But if you do not participate with the Holy Spirit, you are hindering, if not thwarting, his efforts to sanctify you. You're working against him by your inactivity. 
you're refusing to participate. It's just, I mean, everyone, if you ever had kids, you know, when they were little and you try to give them some cough syrup that they didn't like and they're you're, you're trying to give them some medicine and they don't, that's pretty much what we're doing the Holy Spirit. He's like, here's this book that God gave you, read it. But we refuse. You know, I, I read recently, and <laughs> I thought it was a funny quote. It says, if every American Christian was to dust off their Bible at the same time, it would create the world's largest dust storm because we're not reading it. We live in the most biblically illiterate generation in Christian history, and that includes the time period in which 85% of the population couldn't read it all because people aren't reading it. You know how I know? I listen. I hear them pray. I hear... And I ain't talking about just laity. I'm talking about pastors. I hear them preach, and I'm thinking, they don't read the Bible. They don't study it. Or you wouldn't be preaching and saying what you're saying if you actually studied the Bible. And we need to understand that this is part of the participation process. Memorization of Scripture is part of the process. You say, well, that's for children. No, it's not. No, it's not. What are you going to fight the devil with? When he comes, when, this, when, these tem- when, when God shows you these sins and he says, this is what you're struggling with, and Satan comes against that temptation, what are you going to pull out if you don't have Scripture memorized? Okay? When I was in the military, they didn't just hand me a weapon and send me to war. They taught me how to use the weapon. They taught me how to fight the enemy. Okay? Scripture is fighting the enemy. What did Jesus use when Satan came against him? The Word of God. And do we actually think that we're better than Christ, that we don't need the Word of God to fight against temptation. But we do have to participate, but we can't earn. You do have to put forth the effort, but you can't earn it. Okay? Now, I know that's sometimes hard for us to grasp because especially as Americans, you know, we want to earn everything. We want to be stubborn. and you, know, you can be as stubborn as you want when it comes to righteousness. You can't earn it. And if we can accept that, Okay, just like being aware of our sin, if we can accept, I can't do this without Jesus. Do what? Anything. Anything. I can't do anything without Jesus. You cannot be a good wife or a good husband. You cannot be a good brother or a good sister. You cannot be a good church member. You cannot be a good human being without Christ. You say, well, I know some people who are good. Do you? How well do you know them? How well does God know them? Okay? No one is good, according to Scripture. No one is a good person, according to Scripture. We are all, you know, formed with this evil inside of us. Carrie. Yeah, they, they think that they're better than God, but they can't do it For those online, Carrie was saying that, you know, that often as we're praying for God to examine us, he'll reveal things to us. But often after he reveals things to us, we don't do anything about them. He may even give us, very likely, he will give us the action to take, perhaps like eliminating a relationship, uh, doing something like abiding, reading your Bible, whatever, and then we choose not to do it. And then sometimes we'll do that and we wonder, well, why doesn't God speak to me more? Well, you haven't done the last thing he told you to do. If you, you, know, you, you think about the last thing God told you to do. Did you do it? And I don't mean uh, go become a missionary in Papua New Guinea. I mean read the Bible today. Talk to me. Give witness. Whatever it was, did we actually do the last thing that God told us to do? And so how do we practice the prayer of examination? Again, by turning inward, not outward, not upward, but inward. God, search me. Uh, I have a quote. I like quotes. Uh, Anthony Bloom said, Your prayer must be turned inwards, not towards a God of heaven, not towards a God far off, but towards a God who is closer to you than you are aware. And I love that quote. 
So many times when we're praying, we have this in our head that God is in some distant galaxy far, far away. You know, we, you know, many people make the statement, I feel like my prayers aren't even hitting the ceiling. God ain't at the ceiling. God is with you. He's all around you. He's in you if you were a Christian. You're praying to a God who is close. Uh, I think it's John Ortborg who has a book called God is Closer Than You Think. And excellent. I mean, most of his books are excellent. I really like him as an author. But when we're praying, he's with us. We forget that. Okay? As you're going through your busy day or what, you know, a day that we claim is so busy we don't have time to pray. And if your day is so busy you don't have time to pray, you're far busier than God ever intended you to be. But he's with you wherever you go. He was with you when you went to the store today. He was with you when you were in the kitchen. He was with you when you were in the bathroom. Okay? Embarrassing as that might be, he was there. He was with you when you were in the shower. He was with you when you were on your break. He was with you when you were talking with your friends. He was with you when you were standing there on the phone complaining about how much your pastor talks too much. He was with you. Talk to him. Talk to him. Not inwards in terms of self-dependence or inner strength, but inwards in such a journey inward that we take with God to reveal the deepest parts of who we are and of our life. And so it's not that we're looking for self-dependence and not like, like we're looking for some sort of inner strength when I talk about inward, the journey inward. I'm talking about we invite God to take us inside of ourself and show us who we truly, truly are. And as we give God more and more access to our lives, he draws us closer and closer to himself by his grace. God will not invade an area of your life. You must open the door. To give him all of your life, you must allow him into all of your life. If you hide your checkbook for God, God ain't going to conquer your bank account. You hide your finances from God, he ain't gonna, you have to invite him into your finances. He's not going to just break down the door and invade your marriage or your family. You have to invite him into that into your motivations, into your attitudes. So how do we do this? <laughs> One time-tested way is journaling. Journaling is a time-tested way of examining the consciousness. Okay? Through spiritual journey, journaling, it, we have a higher possibility of intentional reflection. Why? It's the point of journaling. God, what are you saying to me? Write it down. What are you saying to me this verse? Are you teaching me something about yourself? Are you teaching me something about myself? Are you trying to show me something? Are you trying to encourage me? Are you trying to get me to repent? Reflective questions that we then write down. Okay? I can't tell you how many times in my journaling that God speaks to me as I'm writing. I'll write something, and I'm just trying to pour out my heart to God and be, you know, trying to reflect and all these kind of things. And suddenly I say, I'm, I'm asking God a question because I'll literally ask him a question because when I'm journaling, in my journals, it is if I'm writing the letter directly to God. That's the way I journal. You can journal however you want. That's the way I journal. And there's times I'll, you know, I'll just go back and I'll just look at what I just wrote and realize God answered my question as I wrote, through what I wrote. The focus is on, in journaling, the focus is on why more than on who or what. And when the first journal that I ever did, it's in my office now. We, we, we brought it back from Alabama. It's my journal from the Philippines. And no, you can't read it until I die. And yeah, when I die, Leander and Car Ken Car uh, Kendra can sell my journals and make millions of dollars because I'm a famous preacher from Kincaid. All right? So, but... Uh, when that, I was given that, it was an assignment. My teacher said, when you're there, you got a journal every day. And I don't want a travel log. He, he said that many, many times. I don't want to know where you were and what you were doing and what you were seeing. I want to know the why. Okay? And so when I was there, I'd think up, you know, at night, we'd, Carrie and I both journaled. She didn't have to turn hers in because it wasn't for a grade for her. Or, or was it? It wasn't for you. It was a grade for you. But it was a thing of I was asking God, I feel this way. Why? 
or I, you know, I experienced this as I was praying for this guy or preaching in this church or whatever. Why did I feel that? Why did, why did I have this attitude? Why was I thinking this? And I was asking those questions of why and, and wherefore, if you will. And suddenly, I learned how to reflect. And I think learning how to reflect is something that we don't even realize that we have to do because most people don't want to reflect because they don't want to know what's inside because they have a pretty good idea. It probably ain't the best thing in the world. So, Journaling also helps us see the deeper workings of God in our life, especially in our hearts. Why do you think at the end of every service I ask, what did God say to you today? Because I want you to reflect and say, well, what did God say to me today? I guarantee you he didn't say, I wish the pastor would hurry up so we can beat the Baptist to the restaurant. I know he didn't say that. But he said something. He always says something. There's been times I've said in sermons, and the main point of the, of the pastor's sermon is not what God said to me. Something just a slight comment here or there. Some, sometimes maybe even in his illustration where that, at that moment God spoke into my life. The question is, did I hear it? Okay. Journaling helps us to, to chronicle those things and to keep up with those things. If you actually think you're going to remember the things that God does in your life and the things that God says in your life in your own mind, you're fooling yourself. Because I don't care. I'll, I'll give you a good example. Let's say God heals you of cancer. And God can and he still does heal people of cancer. And you say, well, I'll never forget that. No, not till the next time the doctor tells you you have cancer. Then you'll forget it because you'll panic all over again. And we do that because we don't write it down. You know, one of the reasons that I, I, I wanted all my journals here is I wanted to look over the last almost three years of the time in which God put on pastoring in America in my heart, and I could go through that and see God's work in my life of how he brought me to that point to where I said, I want a pastor. And then I said, what did I just say? Where he changed me. And I can sit there and I can go through those journals and I can look, you know, not all chronologically day by day, but slowly I can look at little things I started saying, little things I started praying that God answered. You're not going to know that if you don't journal. Why? You ain't going to remember all that. You're not going to remember that. Journaling helps us also to make, you know, mile markers. I don't know if you, you know, you know like uh, we plan on going to see Mount Rushmore, and it's a monument, okay? What do you think a journal is? A journal is just nothing but a listing of monuments of things that God has said and did in your life that you will forget if you don't write them down. Journaling also helps us see the struggles that we had in the past, the progress we have made in those struggles, and the areas that we still need to work on. Journaling may not be for everyone, but everyone can try it. And I don't mean for a day. Okay? I don't mean for a day. Buy a journal. A journal is usually about 176 pages. I can give you a lot of places to buy them. Why? Because I try never to buy the same journal twice. Okay? And usually about 176 pages. You can get them with little scriptures on the bottom. You can get them all kinds. You can get them with different line sizes and little scriptures or little pretty ones or ugly ones or whatever. They, they sell them for men and they sell them for women. All kinds of journals. Try it. And when I mean try it, at least finish one journal. At least one. Not one page, one journal. 176 pages. If you journal every day, it can take you anywhere from two weeks to two months. And then tell me it didn't help you focus. Tell me it didn't help you, uh, if you if you actually put your mind and heart into it. If you do it just because the pastor told you, you might not get what you need. But journaling is a means of God's grace like all disciplines. And it's a discipline, okay? You got to journal when you don't feel like it. You got to journal when you're tired, okay? You got to journal regardless. And... It is a means of his grace. Now, you might think, well, the Apostle Paul never journaled. Or one, you don't know that. And two, but look, in, look throughout Christian history in who did. You will not name a major figure in Christian history in the last 2,000 years that did not journal. Martin Luther? Oh, absolutely. 
Hudson Taylor, absolutely. Billy Graham, absolutely. Jim Elliott, absolutely. Charles Spurgeon, absolutely. All these people that we consider so instrumental in the Christian faith, every single one of them committed to journaling. And because of it, today we get some of their spiritual insights uh, into our lives as well. But, okay, that's one way. And I, I, again, I encourage you, try it. And if you need help, come and talk to people who do journal. I, I remember when Leandra first started journaling, she would have her abiding time, praying and that kind of stuff, and she would basically want God to give her a picture. And God would put a picture in her mind, and then in her journal she would draw that picture. Much of her poetry comes from her abiding time. So it's a thing of uh, whatever, you know, find your way. Other little things, relaxing activities, a walk, riding a bicycle, please do so with your eyes open, fishing, family discussions, etc. Hanging out with other people in the church and talking about actually what's going on inside of you. And I'm not talking about the good stuff. Uh, one of the things that I find is very, very difficult in, with, with people, and to me it seems harder with Western people, is when you ask them how things are going in their life, either it's a complaining session, but it's never about what God is doing in their life. One of the things that I often do when I go to minister meetings is I will ask other pastors, what's God doing in your life? And you could look, and you, you would thought I'd ask them what was, you know, the, the theory of relativity when I asked them those questions. Because if you can't tell me what God has spoken to you this week, you haven't spent enough time with God, and you're not listening, and you're not reflecting. If you can't even tell me what God told you on Sunday, you weren't listening, because God spoke. Do we hear him? Regular and prayerful meditation of the Ten Commandments in the Lord's Prayer is one of the ways that we can do this as well. Go through the Ten Commandments and say, God, which ones am I not so good at? He's probably going to say, all of them. <laughs> you, know? you have to find out what they mean first, you know, what it means to use the Lord's name in vain, because I hear it a lot in church. And God takes using his name pretty seriously. But I hear his name used a lot in vain in church. Uh, go through that list. Also go through the Lord's Prayer and hold it up as a standard to examine your consciousness. Okay? God, am I really concerned more with your kingdom and your will than my daily bread? Am I really willing to pray, give me my daily bread? according to your will? Because usually when we start our prayers, we skip, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We skip, a lot of times we even skip, hallowed be your name. Our Father, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Now he wants to give you. He wants to answer your prayers according to his will for the purpose of his kingdom and his purpose for your life. And his number one purpose is who you become, who he, he wants to make you, the sanctification of, of your soul. And then finally, a personal retreat. Okay? This costs money. You go on vacation to rest your body, why not go on a vacation to spend time with Christ? If you don't know of a place, I know a really good place in South Illinois, Southern Illinois. 60 acres would be all to you. $150 a night. 60 acres, big pond, even a jacuzzi. If you can't, you know, you can really reflect in a jacuzzi, all right? But find a place, find a purpose. Have you ever thought about taking a vacation with Jesus? Why not? Okay, the prayer of examination, this is our prayer. And you, if you like to, you can pray it with me. Lord Jesus, my Savior, why do I fear your inspection of my heart and my life and heart? You examine me in love, yet I am still fearful, afraid of what may be revealed. Despite my fears, I invite you to search me to the depths of who I am so that I may know myself as I really am and know you in a deeper, fuller, more intimate way. Amen. Okay? And that is the prayer of examination. Any thoughts?
For those online, Penny was saying that, you know, that she's used uh, how uh, indigenous tribes would pass down stories from the tribe from generation to generation through the narrative. And many cultures do this as far as, like, they, they tell their history through, through story and how she remembers, you know, being with her grandparents and stuff like that around the kitchen table where people are sharing stories that are passed down from generation to generation of what God's done in their life. To be honest, when I'm journaling, that's in my mind that one day my grandchildren will read this. My great-grandchildren will have the opportunity to read this. What I would not do to have something like that from my grandfather. My grandfather was a significant Christian influence in my life. And uh, to have a journal, I mean, I have one sermon on a cassette tape, which I can't even play because, you know, you can't find a cassette player anymore, and it probably went blank anyway. Uh, you know, after 20 years, they go blank if you don't, you know, you don't renew them. Uh, of a testimony that he gave, and but oh, I would love even even the sermons. I, I download them and I keep them, the videos and audios and all that kind of stuff. Not because I like to listen to myself, because I actually hate really to listen to myself. I do it because I wish I had that from my the generations before me, and uh, whatever gets you to journal or to, to record these things or to pass these things along, it's, you know, and I think another th area of this is, is testimony, okay? Now, I understand why, you know, we don't always have testimonies in the church because, I mean, I remember as a kid, you know, one woman standing up, I, you know, it always started this way, I just want to say I love the Lord. That's the way they always started. Everybody always started that way. And it was the same thing she had said 5,000 times, you know? And but I also remember when we were in China, and then in Chinese New Year, we would go to Thailand so we could have a church service in our organization. And I remember, you know, uh, every night we would have something called sing and share, in which people would get up and sing songs until someone wanted to share a testimony. And they'd get up and they'd testify something that had happened in their life, you know, because people were scattered all over China, Mongolia, and Vietnam, and they were sharing the things that God had done in them. And every time we went to that, God spoke to me through that, of, hey, if, if, if God did it for them, God can do it for me. You know, if God does something for you, why should you testify? Because there's somebody else who's going through the exact same thing who needs to hear it. It will build their faith. It will encourage them where they can say, hey, God did it for them. He can do it for me, okay? And uh, we're not going to know that if we don't share. We're not going to know that if we don't talk. No, I mean, let's just be honest. Our phones, our televisions, and our lifestyles are drowning this stuff out from our children, our grandchildren, and future generations. We're too busy sitting around a television, too busy sitting on our, you know, on our phones on Facebook, for crying out loud, instead of talking as a family, sharing what's God doing in your life. You know, one of the things that we did when we were in Dubai, once a week on our, on our Sabbath day, once a week, as a family, we would talk about what's God been saying to you throughout the week. Since we've been here, that's almost completely disappeared, okay? Because, you know, just little things come up with the church and this and that and that, but you have to sit there and say nothing else is going to come up. We can't say we don't have time if we're watching television and we're spending time on Facebook. We can't say that we don't have time to do that. We're just not prioritizing our time and, and talking with one another. Uh, but the next time you have lunch or fellowship with anybody that you know is a believer, insist the conversation go on what God's doing in their life. Now, they may never have lunch with you again after that, but that's okay. Then you don't have to pay for it. So, but in, try to get that out of them. What's God doing in your life? What's God saying to you? If nothing else, maybe it'll get them to go home and start thinking about it. What is God saying to me? Or why am I not hearing anything? Maybe I'm not listening. And to understand that. Carrie?
Don't judge your holiness by another person's sin, Martin Luther. Yeah. Yeah, we're fruit inspectors, just not inspecting our own trees. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, another thing you can do in conversation, ask, <laughs> ask your friend or whoever you're having lunch with or whatever, who you're, you know, uh, do you see the fruit of the Spirit in my life? And give them the liberty to answer you honestly. Because they might say, well, of course not. I mean... If we're honest with ourselves, do we? Uh, when you pray, th- and, and, I, and I, can, I can promise you, you pray this prayer, God will answer it. So you know, sometimes we complain that God doesn't answer our prayer. It's because all of our prayers are for daily bread. Very few of our prayers are, God, show me my sin. Search me. What is my real motivation here? Uh, now, one of the reasons, that I, I mean, and, and maybe it's even the, one of the wrong motivations for doing it, but one of the motivations I have is when I'm going to preach a sermon, I want to preach a sermon with the right motivation. And I'm very concerned of preaching a sermon with the wrong motivation. And so when, as I'm leading up to Sunday, I'm constantly praying that, God, what is my motivation in preaching this? What is my motivation in saying this, this quote or this line or this, you know, whatever? What, 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 what's really in my heart? Please show me that I preach this with your heart and your motivation. And uh, if we were to seek out just that, God, show me my motivation, I think we'd be astounded at how many times our motivations are incorrect and not pleasing to God. How, and motivation matters. Uh, I have a big long list of books that I want to write one day. And one of them is motiv- about motivation. Why? I don't know a single Christian book that's written about motivation when it's one of the main topics of the Lord Jesus. Okay? What's your motivation? The why. The Pharisees did things right. But they did them for the wrong reasons. And Jesus constantly pointed that out, that their heart wasn't in it that they were doing it for all the wrong reasons, and motivation matters. And even if we're just praying, God, what is my motivation? He's going to show you. If you're open to hearing him after that, how is he going to show you? Through his word? Uh, I'm not going to be very specific because it's still very personal, but it's a thing that I've been praying about for years, about something in my life that I had sought counsel on uh, from from Christian uh, people that I respect, I'd gotten answers, and some of them were a little contradictory. And so I'm, you know, I was just praying, God, I, I just really want to know. I mean, you know, I really want to know, do you want this in me or do you want this out of me? And Because I, I, I said, I'm not really sure. And, 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 you know, and, I, and as I, I prayed that prayer, then I thought, okay, well, you know, you, you'll show me in your time. And then I just opened up the Bible where I was reading it, and he answered it right there in Scripture. He's like, now shut up about it. <laughs> you, know, I, I, you know, he answered me. I mean, it was just it's black and white, or you can say red and white. Don't worry about the whole red letter Bible thing. Uh, but it's a thing of, you know, it was right there in his word, right after I prayed it. Now, I have a very systematic way of re- reading the Bible, okay? He knew what day I was going to pray that prayer, and he knew that that day would be the day I read that verse. That's the providence of God. That's the sovereignty of God. He knew he would answer my prayer at that moment in that way in that, qu- in that question of reflection that I had. All right. All right, we'll keep going just for the sake of keep going. Prayer of weeping. You could also call this the prayer of tears. Okay? The Greek word penthos, uh, which could be you know, translated weeping or tears, it basically means broken and contrite, an inward godly sorrow, holy mourning, a deep heartfelt remorse okay so we're not just talking about crocodile tears we're not just talking about those tears so you get what you want from your husband okay or your or your daddy either one or from the shopkeeper i mean one time that you know the person that i pray for every sunday aladin he's a very good friend he's a very devout muslim uh and we met him because uh you know, my parents give our kids money when we don't really want them to. 
and we would take them, when they were little, they'd always want to go spend it immediately. You know, when you give a kid money, they want to go spend it immediately. And so we would go at this shop. And in the Middle East, you have to bargain for everything, everything. And, and so we, would, we wanted the girls to learn that because we assumed we'd spend the rest of our life in the Middle East. And we went into this store, and Leandra is very, very indecisive. Uh, if you start asking Leandra to make a choice about pretty much anything, she gets a little hectic and, and panicked. And she was wanting to buy, she had these two things she wanted to buy, and she couldn't decide which one she wanted. Now, Aladine thought, we didn't know his name then, Aladine thought that, uh, and, and she, st she started tearing up and, getting, and started to cry. Well, Aladine thought she was crying because his price wasn't too low, it was, was not low enough, so he dropped it really, really low. And she got to buy both things because he dropped it so low. And then, oh, they really fell in love with Aladine after that. But her tears convicted him. I mean, you know, made him feel guilty. So he basically probably bought those stuff himself because the price he dropped it at, there's no way both of those things should have been that low. Anyway, uh, that's not the kind of tears we're talking about. We're talking about the tears that are deep in your soul. And if we're going to define them, it's being cut to the heart over our distance and offense to the goodness of God. Basically, our sin. Have you ever wept over your sin? And the reason that we don't weep more over our sin is we have trivialized it and think light of it. Look in Acts, verse 2, 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brother, what shall we do? Okay? What shall we do? It is a weeping over our sins and the sins of the world. It's easy to watch the news and get frustrated or angry. You ever watch the news and weep? It's entering into a chain-breaking shock of repentance. When your sin breaks you, hurts you deep down inside because you know it is absolute rebellion against God and against his goodness in your life. And I, we're not talking about non-believers here. We're talking about Christians. This is a prayer Christians are praying. God, break me. Are you tired of the sin that you've committed for years and years and years? Then ask God to break you. But pray that prayer and make sure you really want it answered. It is the intimate, and I think that's actually a, oh, that's right. It is an intimate and ultimate awareness that sin cuts us off from the fullness of God's presence. Now remember, when you sin, God doesn't stay, take a step back from you. You choose to take a step away from him when you choose to sin. But it does create an absence of his presence. Okay? Now, what is the paradox of the prayer of weeping? When you ask God to break you, when you ask God to, you know, to, to, to give you that broken heart over your sin and the sins of the world, it's joy. It's amazing. It is amazing. The paradox is that you will never experience true joy until you experience true weeping. Until you have learned to cry, you can't experience joy. It produces a joy that cannot be found in any other possible way. I think it was, yeah, C.S. Lewis wrote this, for them the people most to be pitied are those who go through life with dry eyes and cold hearts. And joy is the most obvious result of a heart that has been broken by God in contrition. Okay? Now I know it sounds like a paradox. That's why it's called a paradox. Okay? Basilia Schlenk 
said, The first characteristic of the kingdom of heaven is the overflowing joy that comes from contrition and repentance. Tears of contrition soften, should be soften, yeah, soften even the hardest hearts. Because you won't know the joy of your salvation until you're broken about your sin. You can't experience the joy of what Jesus did for you until you're truly broken about what you did to put him on a cross. Psalm 126 and 5. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. Through the prayer of weeping, we give God permission to show us our sinfulness and the sinfulness of this world at the emotional level. Tears are God's way of helping us move things from the mind to the heart. And once there, bow and worship to God in adoration to him. Okay? I dare you to pray, God, help me weep. Foundations to the prayer of weeping, we're sinners. Not were, are. We are sinners. This is the rock-bottom reality of all of us. Every one of us deserve hell. Okay? Like I mentioned on Sunday, yes, we have the robe, we have God's, the Father's robe put around us. We have the ring of sonship on our finger. We have the shoes on our feet. The fatted calf was killed in order to celebrate us coming home, but we don't deserve any of it. None of it. None of it. And we're not, we, and I like this, we are not sinners because we commit sinful acts. Rather, we commit sinful acts because we are sinners. It's who we are. And God saved us. The sin that is at the heart of who we are? Unbelief. The refusal to believe. Now you might say, well that's not me. Really? Ever worry? Ever been afraid? Ever doubt? Ever hesitate? Do you do everything that God wants you to do? Ever been afraid of dying? Why would you be afraid of dying if you believe everything the Bible says for those who are in Christ? Should, we should all, actually, we should all look forward to it. Unbelief lies at the heart of this. May God help our unbelief. The first act of the resurrected, resurrected Jesus was to institute a ministry of confession and forgiveness. The resurrection is God's absolute acceptance of the redemptive work of forgiveness carried out by Jesus. Uh, most of you know the Old Testament when they would, you know, on the, on the Day of the Atonement, when they take the, the, you know, the lamb in to kill the lamb, how you knew that the sacrifice the high priest had given for the people of Israel was accepted, high priest came out of the, out of the Holy of Holies. He came out of the curtain. Okay? So when Jesus, when the stones rolled away and Jesus steps out of the tomb, it is God Almighty saying, I accept the sacrifice that was given for you and me. Okay? Our, 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 his acceptance of the sacrifice of Christ is absolute. There is no question it. Why? Jesus resurrected. He stepped out of the tomb. Okay? And so our, our redemption has been, has been guaranteed because of that. But the life of a Christian is one of repentance, not once, but continual repentance, again and again and again and again. If you ever get tired of repenting, you're going to get tired of growing in Christ. This is why every Sunday I give people the opportunity to repent, and every Sunday people turn it down. Daily we confess, daily we repent, daily we turn back to God. The prayer of weeping is an aid to our turning because we're weeping for our own sin. The Christian life is a balance of understanding I'm a wretch and I'm a sinner along with what Jesus did, I'm a child of God and a temple of the Holy Spirit and not going too far to either side, to maintaining those at the same time, to accepting the role of the younger son without becoming the older one. 
And this should, and I don't think this is understood in modern Christianity. Repentance is a part of our life. Repentance is something we'll be doing every single day of our life. It's not something to be avoided. It doesn't mean, I know in, in the Pentecostal movement where we want to pretend that we're so righteous and so holy and that we're so much better than all the other denominations, we still need repentance. And let's just be honest, we probably need it more than they do. Because we actually have that thought that I don't need it anymore. And if you have that thought, then you especially need to repent. Because now you're starting to claim it for yourself, what Jesus did for you. In the sense that it, it, it's by your own works. I know it's 8 o'clock, but let me just keep going a little bit longer. And then we'll stop. So how do we experience a contrite and repentant heart? A heart that grieves, a heart that is broken, full of sorrow over our sin and the sins of the world. Okay, when, when you, think of some, okay, you think of someone else in the church and you know their sin, do you use that to feel better about yourself or is your heart broken for them? I don't want them to struggle that way. I don't want them to have to, to, to fight that battle. I want to help them. I want to help them overcome. But how do we do this? And that's where I'm going to leave you for the next two weeks. I'm not going to tell you how. You have to come back. <laughs> now let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for how you're teaching us to pray. So often our prayers are only for our daily bread. We don't give you the glory that's due your name. We don't provide thanksgiving that of all the things you've done. We don't seek your kingdom or your will. We don't even seek forgiveness of our sins that you told us and offer forgiveness for others. And we don't ask to be kept from temptation. All we do is ask for bread. I pray, God, that you will open our eyes and open our hearts, search us, and teach us how to pray. Teach us to pray the prayers that we've learned and to continue to grow and mature in our prayer life. Not so we can say we're better than other people, so that we can become the people that you want us to be. That the things that are in us that, that you want to transform, that we will open those doors to those parts of our life and allow you to come in and transform those areas. That we won't be so prideful, so stubborn to think that we don't need to repent. That we won't be so prideful that we will let anything come between us and a closer walk with you that comes only through repentance. That we didn't need you to save us at one point in the past when we knelt our life and asked you to come into our life. We need you to save us every single day. And we don't only need you to save us from the evils of this world. We need you to save us from the sin that dwells inside of us. And I pray that we will learn how to let you examine us. I pray that we will learn how to weep over what you show us and show us our sins and the sins of this world and break our hearts. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.